All right, so hello everyone. I'm Norman Wahlberger. We're here at the University of New South Wales. And today I'm going to carry on with the discussion that we started with our last lecture. Um, we're going to talk about more about computability and then have a discussion about problems with set theory. And we're going to, have, we're going to hear from a lot of famous mathematicians. So the, uh, the place where we left off uh, last time, well, we started with Cantor's definition of uh, set. This is the sort of fundamental starting point. Cantor defined a set, and that's where it sort of all started. And then we talked about various paradoxes that ultimately were found, in particular Russell's um, paradox, but other, others as well. And then we uh, discussed that there were a number of different sort of attempts to try to get uh, this subject on a proper footing. So there are various schools of thought including uh, logicism, or the logistic school, um, Brouwer's intuitionism, and uh, the formalism of David Hilbert. And we want to talk a little bit more about formalism and its uh, consequences today to start off with. So uh, I remind you that formalism means that you uh, think about mathematical theories They rest on basically undefined notions and axioms about those undefined notions, uh, together with various rules of inference that allow us to deduce various things from the, the axioms. So in particular, so this is formalism here, now we're talking about this particular school of championed by David Hilbert, who was a very prominent mathematician around the turn of the 20th century. Um, okay, so one of the uh, differences here is that these theories don't necessarily need to rest on our intuition. Okay, they can be rather sort of abstract, almost like a, like a, a game. So mathematics becomes a, a game played with symbols. Maybe that's not the way Hilbert would have uh, said it, but others would. So sort I of thought of it that way. Okay, now various challenges that emerged from this is, first of all, if you have such a mathematical theory, which is sort of unconnected from our ordinary experience, how do we know that it's consistent? How do we know such a theory is consistent? And what do we mean by that? Well, we mean that it's not possible to prove a statement and its negation at the same time. You can't prove that A equals B and A, equals, and A does not equal B at the same time. That would be a contradiction. So you're not supposed to have any contradictions. So how do we know that if we start off with some arbitrary notions and axioms, we get a consistent theory? That's one question. And another question is, how do we know that such a theory is complete? And that means that if we come up with a statement which makes sense in the theory, can we prove that it's either right or wrong, that it's true or false? We shouldn't want statements which are sort of ambiguous. You can there's a proper statement, but you can't decide whether it's true or false. So that's the, uh, this notion of, of completeness. So Hilbert's aim, of course, was to try to prove that we could, at least in some situations aim for understanding uh, these properties and, and proving them. But this was all uh, shot down by the work of Kurt Gödel, who we uh, mentioned last time, whose dates are 1906 to 1978. So, uh, Austrian mathematician who ended up uh, spending a lot of time at Princeton in the, in the States. Okay, so he, uh, he proved some rather remarkable results that really led to a lot of soul searching amongst mathematicians at the day. These were considered very sort of shocking developments. That, um, so he showed that if a theory is consistent, and it's sort of rich enough 
to contain elementary arithmetic. So that was, in those days, encoded by pianos, um, axioms for arithmetic with natural numbers. So if we had a theory along the lines of Hilbert, which was consistent and was rich enough to you know, contain numbers inside it, uh, then it is not complete. It is not complete. And that means that we can find a statement, or we can find a statement, or at least we can sort of prove that there is a statement, uh, which can neither be proven true or false. So that was um, quite interesting. And what you might like to think about as an example of such a thing, not in a mathematical uh, sense, but in a sort of more philosophical sense. So for example, this famous statement, this statement is false. OK, that statement. Uh, is an example of a statement that you have a hard time deciding whether that statement is true or false. Okay. So what he's saying is that inside our theory we can find situations like this. And okay, his idea was rather ingenious and complicated and was very hard for mathematicians of the day to get their head around what Gödel was doing. But roughly the idea, um, although may maybe I'm not being entirely uh, accurate here, is, is that um, he encoded statements in his theory, encoded statements <coughs> uh, by assigning numbers to them, so as numbers. So he basically he had a way of encoding you know, some complicated statement, and then you somehow you attach a number to this statement. Okay, it's a rather ingenious way of doing this. But so he has, he has statements as numbers, and then, since our theory has numbers built inside it, that's sort of we're, what we're assuming, then we can interpret a statement about numbers in our theory as a statement about statements. because statements sort of have numbers associated to them, so we can cook up a way that statements are actually referring to statements via referring to numbers. And once you're in a position where you're, you're entertaining statements which are about statements, then you can build in this statement, called the star. Uh, then we build in star. And once we have this thing, then we have a statement which cannot be proven either true or false. All right, so this is a rough, simplistic idea of uh, the proof, but in fact the proof was much more elaborate and so on. But uh, ultimately it somehow com comes down to a self-referential aspect, and you may remember that's not so different from the paradox of Russell where you define the set of all sets which don't contain themselves. Okay, so self-reference is uh, sort of the thing that knocks out um, a lot of things in this subject. Okay, so this uh, historically had a very important impact. So mathematicians started thinking, oh no, uh, mathematics is sort of swimming on a sea of ambiguity, that we, we can no longer be sure about things. Uh, so it had a, a really a strong impact on, on, on mathematicians and the way they thought about mathematics itself. Um, it was so, uh, so definitely a blow to formalism. So while a blow to formalism, somewhat surprisingly, formalism managed to hang on and survive this tempest and ultimately became more or less the established way of cooking up or, or uh, 
thinking about how set theory should be built up. So while a blow to formalism, it did not kill it. And, uh, and ultimately, the modern theory of sets, and ultimately, a set theory did end up taking on a very formalist point of view. Ultimately, set theory um, became an axiomatic theory, very much along the lines of formalism. <coughs> OK, and there's a number of people uh, involved here. So now I'm going to uh, show you the standard axioms of a set theory, which are now the sort of accepted foundation for axiom, the axiomatic approach to set theory. So I've written them up beforehand here, so here they are. These are axioms due to uh, zermelo frankel So the zermelo frankel axioms for set theory, and they're usually denoted uh, ZFC. Also, a C stands for choice, because it has this last but special axiom that originally was not part of the zermelo frankel uh, system. So, OK, would take a lot, some time to analyze uh, these things. Um, and they ha all have names. But let me just uh, roughly give you an idea of what's involved here. Okay. So the idea with this formalism game is that we're, in some sense, not really defining what a set is. We don't really define what a set is. We leave it as some kind of undefined notion. But we assume that we have certain laws or rules that these sets obey. So for example, so in, and in the axioms, whenever there's something like x around, pretty well everything is a set. Okay, so this is all about sets. So the first axiom, which uh, has an official name, it's called the axiom of extensionality. And I'm not going to tell you what all the names are because I don't know them myself. Okay, if x and y have the same elements, then they're equal. If you have two sets whose elements are the same, then they're equal. Fair enough. For any a and b, you can form a set consisting of a and b. If phi is a property with, say, some parameter p involved, then for any x, there exists a y, such that y is equal to u in x, a set of u in x, such that this particular property holds. So we can pick out from a big set a uh, subset by a property. And moreover, we're allowed to have that property depend on a parameter. For any x, we can form the union. So basically, this was telling us that we can perform unions. And the next law tells us that uh, we can form power sets. So for any uh, set x, there's a, another set y, which is the power set or the set of all subsets of x. Uh, there exists an infinite set. Maybe I'll put a star here. OK, also a very contentious one. So we're building into the existence of set theory. We're building in the assumption that there is an infinite set. This is sometimes phrased in terms of building in the natural numbers, and sometimes it's phrased this way. Uh, 7. If f is a function, then for any x, there is a set y, which is f of x. So if we have a function, we can apply the function uniformly to the elements of a set and get another set. Uh, this one here, every non-empty set has an epsilon, uh, uh, containment minimal element. That's basically saying that no set may contain itself. That's there to rule out Russell-type paradoxes. And finally, the cream on the, on the cake, the axiom of choice, which in fact is probably the only of these axioms that most working mathematicians actually sort of use on a regular basis. Okay? So the axiom of choice says that for every family, or every family of non-empty sets has a choice function. Okay, what that means is that if you have lots of sets, okay, and this is a family of sets, whatever that means. Um, then you can create a new set. I'm going to create a new set by taking something in here, and taking something in here, and something in here, etc. I take one element from every set and put it in my other set here. And I'm allowed to do that even if there's an infinite amount of uh, such blue sets, or even if there's a super duper infinite amount of such blue sets. Oh, that's an axiom. OK. so. Uh, these were uh, the axioms that ended up being sort of the official doctrine. These are the, this is the official doctrine today, in 2015. And remarkably, 
this is not just the official framework for set theory. It turns out that this is the official doctrine or foundation for mathematics. Right. So the current view is that mathematics rests on set theory, and set theory rests on these axioms. Very few people seem to have a problem with that, although which I find quite remarkable. <laughs> I find it quite remarkable. I think uh, it's probably true that most mathematicians don't spend a lot of time thinking about these things and whether they actually make sense, whether, whether it bothers us about whether there are terms like this that we're not quite sure what they mean. Or what do all these terms mean? You know, what, does a, what is a property, what's a parameter, what's a function up here? You know, what's a choice function? So there's lots, and, and as well as just what uh, x is, what is a set? All right, so that's all very interesting. Now I want to talk a little bit about another development, development of um, sort of computability. So basically, people started thinking about subsets. If you're thinking about subsets of natural numbers, a subset of n, something like uh, maybe 1, 3, 5, 6, 10, 11, and so on. Uh, this can be associated with an infinite sequence. Uh, you put a 1 there, and then in the third spot, in the fifth spot, six spots, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and so on. And if you want to, you can put a dot in front of it like that, so you actually get a decimal number in binary. Okay. So this is a binary real number. So talking about subsets of the natural numbers, infinite subsets, and talking about binary real numbers, or real numbers more generally, is not really that much different. And it was Alan Turing who in 1937 started thinking about the computable aspect of this. He says, well, we've got, you've got some sequence here, so how should we think about this sequence? Should we think about it as being given by an infinite amount of choice, or should we think about it as being given by an algorithm? Okay. So of course, they didn't have computers back then, so basically he was thinking in the direction of computers, and of course, he was a very brilliant uh, person ahead of his time. So he, was, he wanted to build up a theory of computation. And, uh, and talk about the idea of a computable sequence. He wanted to define what does it mean for a sequence to be computable. Well, these days we say it should be given by a computer program or an algorithm, but back then they didn't have computers, so Turing had to think what does that actually mean? People had been thinking a little bit about computers before, so in particular there was a brilliant English sort of mathematician, inventor, engineer called Charles Babbage, who uh, lived from 1791 to 1871, who actually built the first mechanical computer. And he was also far ahead of his time. So certainly ideas about a you know, mechanical device were around uh, before Turing. But Turing uh, designed a kind of abstract computer. So this wasn't really a computer that you could so easily build. It was more a, an idealized model of what a computer is. And these days this is called a Turing machine. So I need to tell you what a Turing machine is, very briefly. So a Turing machine is um, a machine that writes on a tape. So you have a tape, tape of piece of paper, which is divided into segments. And then you have this uh, sort of device which moves uh, back and forth. This is the head of the tape. And this is like a typewriter or something. It's allowed to um, write on any one of the spots. And it's also allowed to erase. So it can erase whatever is at one spot and it can write a new symbol. So the ingredients are that you have symbols. 
okay? And only a finite list, so A, B, up to, uh, say, Q, okay? You have a finite list of symbols. These are the symbols that are going to appear on your tape. And there's also states. So the state, um, maybe uh, S1, S2, up to Sm. So the finite number of states. So at any given time, the computer is, the, the head is in a certain state, Si. Okay, and then in addition to that, we have sort of transition rules. Transition rules or function. Okay, let me roughly uh, write it like this. So here's the various uh, symbols. Here's the various states. And suppose that we're, uh, we're looking at that a situation where we're in state, maybe I'll make this a B. Okay, there it's a B and we're in state two. So suppose we happen to be in state two and uh, we're, looking at, we're looking at one symbol at a time. We're looking at that B that's right there. So inside here, there's going to be some instructions. And the instructions are of the kind um, change, okay, change the B to uh, F. Okay, that might be one instruction. Okay, so the computer is going to, it's going to look here, it's going to say, okay, I need to change the B to an F. So it will write and change the B to an F. And then the next thing is uh, move to state, so from state, whatever state we're in now, state I, we're going to go to state um, 7. Okay, whatever state 7 is. So the, we're now we're going to change to seven, state 7. And finally, we're going to move right or left. Namely, we're going to move uh, left or right. So at each stage, your head is at some place. You look to see what's written there. You look to see what state you're in. And then you look at the corresponding instruction, and that tells you to change the symbol, change your state, and move one way or the other. Or, I suppose there's also another possibility, where there's a, a halt, where you, the computer's allowed to stop. It might be an, a halt instruction or halt instruction somewhere, because after all, we do want our computers to stop. Okay, so this is all a finite amount of information. You can tabulate this all finitely, and then you can input or you can get this computer to run on some input. So you can give the computer some input. Uh, let's say um, there's a, an A here and a, a B there, and you can put the head here, and you can, there's the head, and you can press uh, go. Or put it in some state, S, S1. You can press go and let it run. And eventually, it will, eventually, hopefully, it will halt, although you're not sure. And then it, you will have some output. Okay. So that will be your output. So you have a computer, a rudimentary kind of computer. So Turing realized that although this is rather rudimentary, it's still surprisingly powerful. In fact, it, it's still the case that Anything that a modern computer can do, more or less, uh, at least in a sort of deterministic fashion, uh, a Turing machine can do as well. So there were other people who were thinking along somewhat similar lines. There was a theory of, of recursive uh, functions. Uh, there was Emile Post and uh, Alonzo Church also in the 30s, in the 1930s, who were working on similar kinds of ways of trying to understand what computing meant. There was something called the lambda calculus. But eventually it became kind of clear that most of these different ways of thinking about computing were more or less the same. They were pretty well equivalent. So one thing, anything that you could do with the Turing machine, you could also do with um, these other ones and vice versa. Okay, so there were a few uh, interesting developments that arose from Turing's uh, idea. So one of the consequences
is that there are only countable number of computable sequences. Count, when I say countable, what does that mean? It means, uh, in terms of Cantor's sizes of infinities, this means sort of the same size as same size as the natural numbers, i.e., what we called Aleph dot last time. So not like the real numbers, but the smallest infinity. So in other words, you can count them. There's the first one, second one, third one, and so on. Well, actually it turns out that uh, counting them, in fact, is, however, is not so easy. So, but listing them seems problematic. Because If you have a first uh, sequence, let, let me stick with z sequences of zeros and ones uh, for simplicity. So there's one a sequence of zeros and ones, a, c a computable sequence, in other words, given by a Turing machine. And then we have another one, and then we have another one, and so on. Then it would appear that we could play Cantor's diagonal argument, which comes up over and over again in the subject. So you can just go down the diagonal, and you can get your machine to basically run through all the Turing machines and, and output this diagonal thing, 0, 1, 1, 1. And then this would appear to be a computable sequence, which is not on your list. But I thought we said we, listed, we could list them all. Well, it's a bit of a conundrum here, and one of the things that Turing realized is that there's a, a subtle problem intertwined here, which is that it's impossible, in general, to tell if a given a Turing machine halts on some input. So this, this tape that we're uh, talking about that's part of the data of the Turing machine is assumed to be infinite. That's an important sort of in ingredient. And it's possible that you might have some sort of loop where, you know, where your instructions just tell your head to keep on moving right, moving right, moving right, moving right forever and ever. Or it's possible that this, this Turing machine just keeps on doing stuff, other stuff which just doesn't halt. So you don't know whether a given Turing machine halts. And so uh, that's somehow uh, involved here in, 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 in this diagonal argument. Oh yeah, okay. Right, this is this is the list, right? A absolutely, right. So we have to we have to take uh, the opposite, one zero zero zero, which is not in the list. Exactly. Thank you. This one's in the list, and uh, and we change the the digits to get something that's not in the list. Thanks. All right. So um, that was uh, another interesting sort of consequence. There was another rather remarkable thing that Turing was able to deduce. Turing uh, discovered that there is a universal Turing machine. A Turing machine that does the job of all possible Turing machines. So this Turing machine, U, what it does if you want to simulate uh, another Turing machine, is it, it accepts the, the data of uh, an arbitrary Turing machine and an input 
and computes. So you can imagine that the input here, there's a string of stuff which is some symbols and states and transitions for a Turing machine, say T. And then over here there's some, some actual real input. So we encode our standard Turing machine as a bunch of uh, symbols and that encode the information of the symbols and states and transitions. And then our big universal Turing machine comes along and takes this thing and reads this first string and figures out which Turing machine it, it's talking about and then basically runs itself as that Turing machine to then take the input and then evaluates evaluates T of uh, X, say the input X. This was also very surprising at the time and, and has interesting uh, consequences for the development of computer science. So, There was some interesting aspect of um, a kind of a, a similarity between the problems that had happened with real numbers earlier and the problems then that sort of arose in the computable setting. So the, the same kinds of paradoxes that were evident uh, with, uh, with Richard's paradox, Barry's paradox in terms of unnameable real numbers ended up having uh, so sort of corresponding paradoxes or conundrums when we talked about computable uh, real numbers. But it, it's nice to also mention another figure here who is a very interesting fellow, who's Emile Borel. It was 1871 to 1956. Emile Borel was one of the most uh, notable and prominent analysts at the end of the uh, turn of the century. So he's a French analyst who basically was a founder of what's called measure theory. And also the supervisor of Lebesgue, supervisor of Henri Lebesgue who en ended up uh, defining our another kind of integral and also in contributing in a major way to measure theory. And Borel also introduced the idea of normal numbers. The idea that if you take the decimal expansion of pi, that that's probably normal. And Borel explained what that means. It means that if you take any string, like the string 1-4, and you look for all the occurrences of 1, 4 in this infinite string and then you sort of compute what's the proportion of 1, 4 as compared to all the other ones. So the proportion of 1, 4s is, uh, well, in the limit as our digits go to infinity should be, uh, I guess, uh, 1%. You would expect that particular combination to not be any more likely than any other two-digit combination. And if the number has that property for any combinations, no matter how big they are, then it's called normal. So he introduced uh, that idea. But also before uh, Turing, he also introduced what's called the uh, Borel's know-it-all number. And maybe this was in the 20s sometime, I think. At some point, Borel, who was a champion of analysis and measure theory and all these new developments, at some point, Borel became disillusioned. It's a very interesting story which is not really that well known, it's sort of a dark secret. Okay? This most prominent of French analysts, at some point he started to have doubts. 
he started to worry that the, the whole thing didn't really make sense. And as he grew older and older, these doubts started to increase in his mind. And by the end of his life, he, he died when he was around 80, 84, he was trying to convince his fellow mathematicians that all was not well. He wrote books, uh, tried to explain that there was something fishy with real numbers. But of course, most mathematicians happily didn't pay much attention, even though he, this is a very prominent uh, person we're talking about. But at sort of at some point, at some transition point, he, he started thinking the following thought. He said, let's think about a real number which answers all possible questions. All possible questions. So let's just, well, let's say all, all questions that can be answered with a yes or no. So we're going to ask all possible, say, mathematical questions. Is 1 plus 1 equal to 2? That one will get a yes. Uh, is 1 plus 2 equal to 4? That one will get a no. But not just trivial questions, also very complicated questions, like is the Riemann hypothesis true? Are there an infinite number of twin primes? So imagine just listing all the possible questions that you could ask, and then putting them in alphabetical or dictionary order. So the smallest ones first, sort of lexicographical order. Smallest ones first, and then you do uh, dictionary order. So you have a list of all the possible questions. And then you replace the yeses with ones and the noes with zeros, and you record the decimal. So that one means that the very f smallest question that you can ask, the answer is yes. The second smallest question that you can ask, the answer is yes. The third smallest question that you can ask, the answer is no. Okay? So this sequence, which is then a real number, contains the answer to all mathematical questions. We don't need to worry about anything anymore. We can just try to find Borel's know-it-all number. And I guess thinking something along these lines, Borel started thinking, does this really make sense? Is this what we want mathematics to be? Do we really want to be considering objects like this as proper mathematical objects? Well, it turns out that uh, Borel was not alone in his um, having doubts about real numbers and Cantor's uh, infinite sets. So I want to now give you a brief, uh, a brief sampling of historical, historical writings and sayings that people had, uh, had to say about infinite sets and generally uh, Cantor's uh, theories. Cantor's theory of sets. So as I mentioned to you last time, Cantor had a lot of controversy when he proposed his new uh, theory. In fact, there were a lot of uh, people who voiced opinions against that. And probably uh, the first person to have a, an opinion on, on this is Aristotle, a famous Greek philosopher who lived 500 years before Christ who said something like this. He wrote on many things in science and, and various things, a very imp important and influential thinker. He said, in writing about infinity, he said, as an example of a potentially infinite series in respect to increase, one number can always be added after another in the series that starts one, two, three. But the process of adding more and more numbers cannot be exhausted or completed. So Aristotle said, yes, you can keep on adding one, but you can never finish the job and say, now we have all of them. This was the standard position with regard to infinite sets for most of history. In fact, basically up to Cantor's time, this is the opinion that most people had. In particular, Cantor himself acknowledges, and I'm quoting now George Cantor, it is well known that in the Middle Ages, all scholastic philosophers advocate Aristotle's infinitum actu non datur as an irrefutable principle. Okay, that's some kind of Latin, which translates to um, actual infinities are not possible, only potential ones. So you're allowed to talk about 
this infinity going on and on in that direction, but you are not allowed to talk about closing it up and grabbing all of them into a set. But of course, that's exactly what Cantor was trying to do. OK, so how did, uh, oh, maybe also before Cantor, we should also mention uh, Gauss in a very famous uh, sentence. So Gauss wrote in a letter to his friend Schumacher in 1831. This is uh, 40 years before Cantor's development. I protest against the use of infinite magnitude as something completed, which is never permissible in mathematics. Infinity is merely a way of speaking, the true meaning being a limit which certain ratios approach infinitely close, indefinitely close, while others are permitted to increase without restriction. Now, when Cantor developed his uh, theory, uh, there were a lot of uh, very vigorous opponents. And probably the most prominent opponent was uh, Kronecker. Kronecker said, I don't know what predominates in Cantor's theory, philosophy or theology, but I am sure that there is no mathematics there. In fact, uh, Kronecker had a very public opposition to uh, Cantor. There was, it was a very heated debate, not very pleasant al always. He, he called uh, Cantor a scientific charlatan, a renegade, a corrupter of youth. Um, and it became quite, uh, uh, quite fierce. So um, I also want to uh, quote um, uh, Poincaré, Henri Poincaré, who in 1906 um, wrote, this is right in the middle of all this controversy, he wrote, there is no actual infinity that the Cantorians have forgotten and have been trapped by contradictions. Weil, who was Hermann Weil, a very prominent 20th century mathematician, mathematical physicist, wrote, classical origin was abstracted from the mathematics of finite sets and their subsets. Forgetful of this limited origin, one afterwards mistook that logic for something above and prior to all mathematics and finally applied it without justification to the mathematics of infinite sets. This is the fall and original sin of Cantor's set theory. And I also would like to actually quote from George Cantor himself. So in order to justify his thoughts about infinity, he resorted to the following kinds of arguments occasionally. So he wrote, Accordingly, I distinguish an eternal, uncreated infinity, or absolutum, which is due to God and his attributes, and a created infinity, or transfinitum, which has to be used whenever in the created nature an actual infinity has to be noticed. For example, with respect to, according to my firm conviction, the actually infinite number of created individuals in the universe as well as on our Earth and probably even in arbitrarily small extended piece of space. That's maybe a bit hard to understand. Here's a shorter thing that from Cantor that I think that more carefully, uh, succinctly captures what he's trying to say perhaps. So he's talking about justification for infinite sets and he says, one proof is based on the notion of God. First, from the highest perfection of God, we infer the possibility of the creation of the transfinite. Then, from his all grace and splendor, we infer the necessity that the creation of the transfinite, in fact, has happened. So there was an, an element, a religious element, to, uh, to some of this. And uh, later, as we move into the 20th century, one has to quote Ludwig Wit Wittgenstein, this most prominent philosopher of the 20th century, who wrote uh, many things about mathematics. But one of the things he... Uh, he said about, about uh, set theory was the following. The mistake in the set theoretical approach consists time and again in treating laws and enumerations as essentially the same kind of thing and arranging them in parallel series so that one fills in gaps left by the other. At other points he says set theory is wrong and he, uh, at another point, uh, he lamented that mathematics is ridden through and through with the pernicious idioms of set theory, which he dismissed as utter nonsense that is laughable and wrong. 
And maybe finally, I'd like to uh, quote uh, Abraham Robinson, who was um, more, more modern, uh, the developer of what's called non-standard analysis, okay, which is a rather interesting, important uh, development. So Robinson wrote, infinite totalities do not exist in any sense of the word, i.e. either really or ideally. More precisely, any mention or purported mention of infinite totalities is literally meaningless. And on another occasion he says, indeed, I think that there is a real need in formalism and elsewhere to link our understanding of mathematics with our understanding of the physical world. So although these days there is near uniformity that mathematics is built on these axioms, I think the case still hasn't been made and the, the, the whole situation is still open. And I'm hoping that in the future we will come to have a more computationally, more feet on the grounds approach uh, to, to mathematics. We should be able to do better than to uh, claim that mathematics is built on, on, on these things. So lots of interesting uh, developments in this uh, chapter and, uh, and lots more to say. If you're interested in more about this, I will say a lot more about these things in my Math Foundation series. <laughs>